Hello, my name is Jacob, and you're watching my show about literature. And only literature! The character of the Lama is deeply embroiled in a conflict of the spiritual and the secular, which should come as no surprise considering that he is a Buddhist. His stated purpose in life is to bathe in the river of the arrow, thus freeing himself from the wheel of things and attaining enlightenment. However, the Lama feels that he is hindered by his paternal attachment to Kim. As he states in chapter 5, I stepped outside from, from the way, my Chila. It was no fault of thine. I delighted in the sight of life, the new people upon the roads, and in thy joy at seeing these things. I was pleased with thee who should have considered my search and my search alone. Now I am sorrowful, because thou art taken away from me, and my river is far from me. It, it is the law which I have broken. The dilemma of whether to pursue the river of the arrow or allow his personal affection for Kim to continue becomes the primary fi uh, fixation of the, uh, of the Lama. It stands in direct contrast to the single-minded purpose of gaining salvation that he possessed when he first encountered the young ruffian. One might go so far as to say that he was extremely naive and sheltered. <clears throat> as Kim so aptly puts it, Never did Yogi need Chila as thou dost. And truly, had it not been for his efforts, the Lama would have been at a terrible disadvantage. He recognizes this fact, of course, and even attributes it to a sign of good fortune and divine providence. He states that Kim came to me in place of him who died, on account of the merit which I had gained uh, when I bowed before the law. But is this really a case of divine providence, or is it merely a happy coincidence? The causality of the incident is central to solving the Lama's spiritual division. If Kim truly is an act of divine inter intervention, then he is freed from his role as a stumbling block to the Lama. Seen from this perspective, Kim takes on the mantle of the Lama's catalyst for salvation. We see him depend more and more on his young disciple, even to the point where he is being literally carried by Kim. The distances that, uh, they travel become increasingly minute, where before they were, they were able to uh, cover vast mountain ranges in a single day, Kipling relates to us that they progress no more than a couple of miles a day now, and Kim's shoulders bore all the weight of it. The burden of an old man, the burden of the heavy food bag with the locked books, the load of the writings on his heart, the Lama's meditation, held the weary head on his lap through the noonday heat, standing away the flies till his wrist ached, begged again in the evenings and rubbed the Lama's feet, who, who rewarded him with the promise of freedom today, tomorrow, or at furthest the next day. This dependence does not last forever, as the Lama slowly comes to the realization that his reliance on the boy has slowly taken its toll and brought him no closer to enlightenment. He confesses that he has, uh, I have stolen the strength from thee. We will go to the woman of Kulu. She shall acquire merit in housing us, and especially in tending me. Thou shalt run free till strength returns. To rely on Kim was a grave error. It is true that he would ultimately lead the Lama towards enlightenment, but not in the way he expected. It is only after he releases Kim from the, from the burden of carrying the llama that they both find what they are looking for. Thanks for watching again. Hope that you enjoyed this examination of the character of the llama. Um, as always, if you like what you see, don't forget to like and subscribe. And hey, if you have a comment, leave it below. Hope you guys have a great day. Peace!